ist cool. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Muhammad, Khatim al-Nabiyyin, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of our viewers and listeners from around the world. We begin as always by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is his right to be praised and sending peace and blessings on his beloved Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his family, his companions, and all those who follow them until the day of Qiyamah. We have once again gathered here in the remembrance of Allah and the remembrance of his beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as told to us in the Hadith, whoever remembers Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in a gathering, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala remembers them in a gathering far more lofty and far more greater than their gathering. So we pray that as this radio is streamed, that everybody listening at home and all of us in the studio today are included within this gathering. Welcome to day 20 of the Alim Dad Radio Ramadan 2022. I'm your host, Molana Talha, and with me today we have our Molana Sufyan, who inshallah will be continuing with his Sira lessons. Molana, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, how are you, Molana? MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. Um, do you want to give the, uh, the listeners a brief overview of what we've done over these last few days and inshallah where we are now? Inshallah. So, as we always have a recap of the blessed Sira, previously on the Sira of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi we discussed that beautiful moment when the Prophet Sallallahu yes. left from uh, the cave of Thor, from the Ghar of Thor. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he advanced towards the city of Yathrib using the mm -hmm. coastal route. And this meant that all of those people that had been told that there's a bounty on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu yes. Alaihi they were all going one way or all of the possible routes towards Yathrib because they knew that that's mm -hmm. where they'd be suspected they'd go. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was going towards a coastal route where nobody would suspect, would suspect him. This again showed the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in this plan. We discussed how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was continuing on this route until there was one by the name of Suraq ibn Malik, a Bedouin who lived in that region, who noticed Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiAllahu and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going. So he came after them, and the miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the horse, the horse, uh, you know, lifted up and you know dropped Suraq three times until Suraq himself spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and guaranteed them safety. And from now on, not only am I going to put, uh, not pursue you, I'm going to turn away and deter anyone else who might be coming towards you. We also discussed how the Prophet Sallallahu then continued on his journey and met uh, the, the famous uh, Sahabiya Sayyidah Umm Ma'bad radiallahu anha and a beautiful description of a vision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Dua Allah grant us that vision also. Ameen, Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. We spoke about how the, these, the, her and her husband then uh, you know, accepted Islam just at the one interaction with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We discussed how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued from that moment onwards and how he reached he, towards the end of his journey at Quba only to be intercepted by Buraida and his 70 soldiers. With that, again, with that one interaction and with the beautiful wordplay of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his beautiful smile, Buraida not only uh, you know, accepted Islam, but he came as a reason to stop the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he turned and said, can I be your entourage and your bodyguard ensuring you safety as you enter into your destination? And with these men, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered into Quba, the land of his maternal cousins, where the last time he was here, he was just a six-year-old boy. He was with his mother. He was enjoying in a swimming with his cousins. And it was, it was one of the, the last few times the Prophet ﷺ was truly happy. Before all the pain of losing his mother and grandfather and uncle and the persecution in Makkah and he's losing his beloved Khadija radiallahu and all of those pains that came after. This was the last time he was truly happy. He hadn't witnessed a major you know, pain in his life just yet, besides the fact that his father had passed away before he was born. So he returns to this land of Quba. He meets with Sayyidina Ali radiallahu and after Sayyidina Ali radiallahu and gives away all of the, the amanat and the trust that were given to the Prophet Sallallahu even if they were for the enemies. And as we know, that's why we call him as Sadiq al Amin. And the Prophet Sallallahu then, after reuniting with the Sahaba, he establishes the, the Masjid al-Taqwa, the Masjid al-Quba. He spoke about the Fadil of Masjid al-Quba, that you know, just going and praying as a reward of an Umrah. And the Prophet Sallallahu would regularly visit Quba out of his love for the Quba and the, and the Masjid. And the Prophet Sallallahu gave that, that famous khutbah, known as the Khutbah al-Taqwa, you know, joining everyone in, in Taqwa of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then together they, they, they you know, traveled forward with Burida and his 70 men guarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as they entered towards the city of Yathrib. We spoke about a beautiful moment when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, having left you know, a city of his, his father, his homeland, his, the city of his family, but being you know, persecuted in a way that he has to leave fighting for his life, being surrounded in his own home by his own you know, family, his own tribe, trying to kill him. 
and yet coming to a scene of strangers, coming to a city where at this moment we don't even know why when we were told that, that the Prophet was just given different options. Allah showed him different options and says, wherever your heart inclines to, that's where your hijrah will take place. And when we look at all the other places, they look way better than Yathrib. They have a history behind them. They have some kind of significance behind them. And Yathrib has no plus points. It's a place that's known for discord. No one gets along. Everyone hates each other. Even family against family is competing. It's a place full of uh, in disease and famine. The air quality is you know, rated at its lowest. And this is a place where the Prophet ﷺ only has one memory. My father passed away here and I met him in his grave. Altogether, there was no reason for us to feel why would the Prophet come awesome. here. But we, when the moment the Prophet enters Yathrib, we see why Allah made his heart inclined there. Why did the Prophet's heart incline there? When he sees the beautiful vision, and the people are on their mountain tops for days just searching in the distance to see when is the Rasul coming? Because awesome. their heart's yearning for him. And then the Prophet comes and sees that every person in Yathrib, the moment the caller calls, they all flood, flush out of their homes. They rush out of their homes. And even the little children, the little girls are singing that beautiful song of Tala al-Badru alayna. They're telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how their beautiful moon rose over them. How it's wajib. They made it wajib upon them to do shukr. That, they, that verse of the Quran, Allah says, they, uh, 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 Allah gave his man, his in, in, uh, um, ingratable favor, the one that you, you can't show gratitude for. That Allah, Allah says, you better remember this favor as I'm imposing that favor upon you. It's that I give you my messenger. I raise my messenger, my beloved amongst you. That statement, they understood it from the very moment the Prophet entered. Think, wajib al shukr alayna. It's absolutely wajib, obligatory upon us to do shukr that Allah gave us you. As long as you're amongst us, we have to do shukr. That they understood that. And with that love, they met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was overwhelmed seeing this, this multitude of people. He was overwhelmed by seeing that there were people on the mountaintops showing you know, off their skills or making like some kind of a show. You know, when you have a grand entry, there's flames being thrown in the air, there's archers you know, showing their skills of archery. They almost bring up like a, a show, if you will, a demonstration because of how happy they are that the Prophet Sallallahu is coming. And then he sees the little girls and he speaks to them saying, do you really love me this much? The little girls have never met him. And the Prophet then says that I love you. If you really love me this much, then I love you, in other words. And he's so overwhelmed by this muhabba that they've shown him. And that place that was known for discord is suddenly uniting in one voice, saying the same tones. Just by the nisbah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they already, hearts were already united. And Sayyidina Anas Allah, was just a little boy of 19 years old. He just looks and he's in his innocent you know, words, he just says, Anarat kulla shay. This place that was you know, dark, everything's become illuminated. Everything's you know, lit up. It's like everything's glowing just because the Prophet has come. And at that moment, the touch of the Prophet Sallallahu transformed <coughs> the city of Yathrib to Medina al Munawwara, the city of light. That's where you know, we continue uh, in this episode today, uh, from this moment onwards. So Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Nabina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam Nawitu ta'allum wa ta'aleem wa ta'dhukur wa ta'dhkir wa nafa'a wa l'intifa'a wa l'ifadata wa l'istifada wa l'hathara al-tamassuki bi kitab Allahi Azza wa Jal wa sunnati Rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa addu'a ila al-huda wa addalalata ala al-khayr ibtigha'a wajhi Allahi wa maradatihi wa kurbihi wa thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassili amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli So as we say every day as the clouds disperse and we go to this beautiful glowing serene moment when the Prophet sallallahu is entering into the city of Yathrib and transforming it in one touch to Medina and Munawwara like we said yesterday if this is the transformation that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi brings to a piece of land what about that heart that is touched by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and we spoke about that beautiful poem that the poet says in Urdu that wa mere dil mein rehte hai he stays he resides in my heart my heart is Medina because by him coming into my heart it'll become like Medina no matter how dark it is no matter how broken it is no matter how much hatred there is that hatred will go away and turn into love it'll turn into unity and it'll turn into light because the Prophet ﷺ is in my heart and as the Yemenis say as they have on their mountaintops he lives in our hearts Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah make it a reality in our hearts Amen. so the Prophet ﷺ as he's entering into this beautiful scene you know, and as he's going through he's going through that path that we saw and that long road that we saw, as it's entering through them, through the two mountaintops, various things happen, which will be discussed in other episodes. But at this moment, we're just going to focus on the journey of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. As he's going through, you can just imagine, you know, looking up and just seeing this audience that are cheering and just singing and just elated to see you. Imagine being met, met with such warmth and love after 13 years of persecution from complete strangers. Mm. And that is Iman. And these people, they came 
that as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered, you know, uh, the moment he goes past the mountain pass and into, in, into the place where people were inhabited, you, people literally came and whole held on his camel saying, you come to my house, come to my house. He was being forced out of his home and these people are saying, no, come to my house, come to my house. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeing, look at the, the, the shafqa, the, the compassion, the diplomacy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He doesn't want to upset anyone and he knows this is the place that's broken with discord. I don't want to give one person a uh, reason to say, I'm better than you. Uh, you know, look, uh, everyone else going to be upset with me because they didn't get the honor of pulling the prophets. He listened to me. I must be better than you guys. He let go of all of that and he just he said, look, leave my camel. Da'uha, fa inna ma'muratun. For, for indeed, she is divinely guided. She's got a divine GPS. She knows where she's going to stop. And the, who, who can argue with the decision of a camel? Mm-hmm. No one can say the camel favored me over the Allah divinely guided her. So the, the, the beautiful kiswa of the Prophet she continues going, going, going. And each member of Medina now, that singing has turned into like a silence almost. They're waiting with suspense saying, where is the camel going to go? Everyone's you know, making dua. It's like when the opposite to what we do on Thursdays, you know, when one another is going to choose someone to do the seeha, we're like, yeah, no, no, this, yeah, no, me, please, please. They're asking, let it be me. And as the, the camel passes by, the hearts are broken. Yeah, I wish it was me. But the camel keeps going and keeps going until it comes and it halts and it stops at one place. And the people surrounding there, they were too old for them, and Sahel and Suhail. That land belonged to them, and they had a house just near there with the uncle. And they said, it's going to be us, and everyone near there, it's going to be us. But the camel stands up again, and keeps going. And everyone's thinking, ah, oh, so close. The camel keeps going just further ahead, until where the house of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he, he comes there, and it stops there. And there, it finally parks himself. But now the issue is, that two people on one side, you have the house of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, and on the other side, you have another house of another Yathribi, another Medina Sahabi, who both of them rush and say, Ya Rasulullah, you've got to come to our house. So now it's even more question to catch 22. You've stopped at a location, but there's two houses now. So now, boy, you were Ansari, the Lord, he goes up a step further. He just takes the bags of the Prophet and he says, You're with me. And the Prophet turns and he says, A man is with his provisions. I'm not going to. He didn't say no. He didn't even break that person's heart. He says, mm. A man is with his provisions. And be like this, the Prophet alights. And dismounts at the house of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al Ansari. And this, um, this spectacle of the Medinans welcoming the Prophet, وسلم, it comes to a close here where they're waiting to see the Prophet وسلم, enter into this home. And all of the Sahaba who come with the Prophet وسلم, who have already had places to stay temporarily. And now there's a little bit of context here. Why that house? When the Prophet said, Why why did Allah want to guide her, 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 her the Kiswa to stop in the first place? And move up and go to the, uh, further ahead and stop there at that house. Why was it that about you, brother, was the one guided and given tawfiq? The other sahabi could have been given tawfiq mm-hmm. to take the bags of the Prophet. And until money, Allah decreed for him to be there. And in order for this, you know, this gives us a little bit of hope. Because when we hear this story, we say, we think, wish we could have been there. Wish we could have had that love and the connection with the Prophet. Mm-hmm. That house has a special significance even before the birth of the Prophet. Mm-hmm. Because years, and some ulama say even 600 years before the Prophet. Mm-hmm. There was a king by the name of Tubba. This was a Yemeni king that was in, a previous, in his previous uh, um, uh, life before he uh, approaches the city of Yathrib. He's a, a very tyrannous king. He's a very rich and very uh, affluent king and he's just set on world domination. His army is just going and fighting day and night, conquering lands until he, the army reaches the city of Yathrib. Mm-hmm. When they reach the city of Yathrib, they're conquering it. But when the king comes here, he meets uh, some uh, priests and some monks and some rabbis and he speaks to them and when he starts learning about the religion his, his was a heart that was made for Hidayah so his heart begins to incline towards it and he says you know what you've introduced me to Allah this is so beautiful to me I leave my kingdom I leave my you know trail of world domination I've left all the way behind I just want to stay here and learn more about Allah he learns more and more about Allah until Allah then meets him introduces him to the text that describes his beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam yes. he starts reading these verses about the coming the final prophet to come he starts reading this verse saying, wow, who is this Nabi that's you know, coming? He reads this, these small snippets of the Shamail of the Prophet that are mentioned in the previous books and he falls in such deep love with the Prophet that he makes his life's new goal just to meet the Prophet He says, Ya Allah, I'm in the city of Yathrib. I just want to meet your final messenger. And the amazing thing is that the, you know, centuries later, even when the people of Yathrib, before they even meet the Prophet when they first see him in Mina in the 11th year, they say, wait a minute, we've heard for centuries, our forefathers have heard about the Jews of Medina and the Christians of Medina and other areas speaking about the final prophet. And everything we've heard them, the most striking qualities, we're seeing them in this man just by looking at him. This is physical description matches what they say. 
for centuries. So when the Prophet enters Yathrib, the people of Yathrib who have accepted Islam, the Jews are already intrigued saying, so this is the person we've been speaking about for centuries. And 600 years or six centuries before, Duba is reading these same descriptions. And to give an example of how, how exactly uh, intricate these descriptions are, there's one that we'll discuss a little later on, but there's one I want to give mention now. Even in the remnants of the Bible that we have right now, the Bible is split into two main parts. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is everything before Isa a.s. And the New Testament is everything after Isa a.s. So you have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are supposedly disciples of Isa a.s. that wrote uh, in a certain manuscript, certain Gospels. And whatever remnants we have of them, that's what we form into the 28 or 27 books or so that make up the, the New Testament. So that's everything after Isa a.s. As for Isa a.s. time, we don't have any copies of that Gospel. It's completely lost. But before that, everything before Isa a.s. So starting from Musa a.s. time till Isa a.s. time, the Old Testament is a compilation of books and scripture which they say is either attributed to Musa is either attributed to uh, the, uh, Dawud the Psalms, which we know is the, the modern remnant of the Zabur. Mm. Then we have different, different books like this. The first five books of the Old Testament, we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These first five books are meant to be the last remnant of the Torah. That's what's there. In these books, you have you know, so many descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ. Some that are going to be almost remnant to what's happening in the Prophet's entry, entry to Medina when we go back to that time. But there's one here that even in whatever's remaining, even after all the alterations, there are some manuscripts of the Bible which have over 6,000 copies. Not one is the same. But yet in this final, in, in this modern Bible that we have so many years later, in the book of Isaiah, the 29th chapter, 12th verse, you're going to see a verse which is telling you a description of the final prophet to come and a final scripture, the greatest, like this special book, like you know, that book, you're talking about this book which is so esteemed, because that book will be revealed unto the one to whom it said, read, and he will say, I, I cannot read. Look how in intricate it is. Even the Ikra Bismi incident is mentioned there to this day, saying that book that we're talking about that is so esteemed, is going to be given to the one to whom it will say, read Ikra, and he will say, Ma I cannot read. I'm not learned. I'm unlettered. So it's, Dubai is reading these kind of descriptions in the scriptures that the, the, the rabbis and the priests and the monks had and he falls absolutely in love and only, only Allah knows what was there in the original forms. You know, to give an example, there's a gospel by the name of Gospel of Barnabas. The Gospel of Barnabas is a book which describes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to such detail, to such depth that if someone was to read it, the, 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 the often claim is that this book was forged by the Muslims afterwards. So it's so intricate it had to be forged by the Muslims after the, birth, uh, demise, after the, the advent of the Prophet mm -hmm. You guys had to come together and put these sections in because it, it, it could not be that one book described Muhammad's in exactly. such detail. So the common answer, when people read that book, they said, well, it's a fabrication by the Muslims. The amazing thing is that book was listed. The, the, the scholars of the biblical scriptures, they have the registers of which books they were choosing to uh, grade as authentic mm -hmm. and as weak and as this and as that. Yeah. So they used to make registers of all the scriptures and then they used to go through and save through each one of them. Mm -hmm. Now the, the register of the Gospel of Barnabas, where it's first mentioned, is actually 60 years before the Prophet was even born. They had that book registered there saying, this is the books that we need to, one of the scriptures we need to go and choose whether which you know, section of the Bible we're going to put in. So Tuba is reading these descriptions of the Prophet Wasallam, and he's absolutely in love with him. And he builds a house. He builds a house for the Prophet He says, Ya Allah, when your Rasul comes in anticipation for him, I'm going to build a house for him. So I'm going to be the one that will host the Prophet in, in my home as a gift to him. And then he starts writing poems in a declaration of love to the Prophet He writes a declaration of love, one, two, and these tablets of stone. You know, long tablets, just poems after poem. And he keeps you know, these in his arms. He sleeps with them. In his night. He tells his daughters, think, you know, you've got to you know, revive this love of the Prophet And then it comes to a point where he realizes he's not going to make it. He's going to pass away and he's not going to see the Prophet ﷺ. But look at the love and yearning that Allah accepted centuries before. He takes those tablets, he says, bury me with these tablets that are my declaration of love to my Prophet ﷺ. And do me a favor, this house and these tablets, I'm going to entrust it to one of you, one of the scholars that was there, one of the alims that were there. He entrusts the house and this is your house. You have to stay in it and you have to take these tablets and poems and keep them and give them to the Prophet ﷺ when he comes. The, the four, uh, you know, uh, so many centuries later, the direct descendant of the alim is Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And the house that he's living in is the house that Tubba built. Allah took that declaration of love to such a level that when the whole of Yathrib are 
poured in their love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah through the love of one person that died centuries ago and made it t- t- stand the, the test of time mm-hmm. saying you're going to go into that house that he built with so much love for you so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enters into that house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari the descendant of that same scholar and g- goes in the house that Tuba built for him mm-hmm. now you, that, that's a you know, time travel if you will you go back in time and that house is built for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for this moment he, so he believed in the Prophet without seeing him and loved him. And Allah honored his love so much. What about us in reverse that? If we do it years after him, centuries after him, how will Allah accept our love? When we pray, Allah give us that kind of love yeah, that can yeah. be accepted in, in, yeah, yeah. in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sent back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The weak being of those people that he yearned for when he says, Wa akhwa, you know, oh my brothers, that I yearn to see and meet. And we can meet him at the Quran and he's just as happy with us and, accept, and Allah accepts our love such just as Tubbas and the Sahabas were. So the Prophet now goes into this house and a fun fact to mention at this point as well is the first place where the camel halted, some of the, the scholars of Syria said that's actually where Tuba was buried. And that we, we will see what happens in that land for even more and in a, a bit further on. But the Prophet now entered into the home of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub and Ansari Now when they go into the home of Sayyidina Abu Ayyub and Ansari he doesn't care, you know, his family, his wife, nothing. He just says, I want utmost uh, you know, comfort and convenience for the Prophet So he gives the Prophet the bottom floor. So you know what, rather than you having to step or go up and down, he offers the Prophet, you can take the top, you can take the bottom position when you want. The Prophet said, some riwayat, so it's easier because the people will come to visit me and so that I don't disturb your family, you can stay upstairs and I can sit downstairs. And said, Abu Ayyub says, yeah, it's easier for you. I don't want you to have to climb the stairs all the time. Mm-hmm. So he gives the Prophet the bottom floor. And the Prophet now enters this home. He obviously has to unpack, the Sahaba have to unpack. All of this is going on. So now you were sorry, he goes up and they, they just take all of the stuff and his family moves upstairs. His children, wife, everyone goes upstairs to the, to the top of, upper floor. And he tells his wife, cook for the Prophet. You know, I just want to serve the Prophet in whatever way I can. But in these few glimpses, we're going to see how much ihtiram and love that the Sahaba had for the Prophet. You know, the adab that, the, that they had for the Prophet. And this is without ta'aleem. They have not been told. There's no hadith to tell them, you've got to do this. Abu Ayyub, when he comes to your house, this is what you have to do. Mm. Allah instilled it because of the love that he had, the adab that he had. He tells his wife, you know, produce food for the Prophet. And every day he, he takes the plate, he, he, you know, they make it in the best fashion, and he goes downstairs and he gives it to the Prophet. And then they come upstairs and they wait, they don't eat. He says, I'm not going to eat, I know there's more food there, but I'm not going to eat. That might be smelling, I might be hungry, it might be you know, smelling really nice, but I'm not going to eat that food. He'd wait until the Prophet is finished. And then he'd go downstairs and when he'd take the plate back up, he'd look at the, the traces of where, where can I see the finger marks of the Prophet. And he'd take that and put it, take it as a morsel. The family would, would, would just want to eat. And take the baraka and baraka from touching that place we touched the, the hands and the saliva of the Prophet. That's what they wanted. That's what they would eat. And one day, he, he, the same thing happens, same routine. He's sending the food. And the Prophet, he, uh, yeah, he's, he's given the food. He goes to take, take the plate back. When he comes back, he sees that the plate has been untouched. Yeah. He goes into a state of like, so, such agitation that he runs down. He, I'm, really, I'm really sorry. Is the food, was the food wrong? Was it not nice? I'm really sorry. Like, he just he doesn't want to cause that much to leave to the Prophet. And the Prophet says, no, no, no. It, the food had a, like a, a scent of uh, garlic and onions. And I don't eat these scents because they, they're not nice smells. And I speak to angels. Mm. So angels don't like good, uh, bad scents. So I don't eat that. So now about you, so from that day, the house of uh, about you was devoured of uh, garlic and onions. We're not going to eat that anymore. Just because of the amount, how desperate he was, the yearning to, to have that the Prophet would eat, he could feed the Prophet and he could eat from that. And Allah grant us the opportunity in Jannah to Amen. feed the Prophet Amen. to eat from his, his Athar. So this takes place. Then you're going to see his wife looks at Sayyidina Abu Ayyub and he sees a change in him. As we know, the Prophet is, is living in the floor beneath and they are on the floor above. Now, when you're in a house, when you're on a floor, you've got a hundred different things to do. You've got to sleep, you've got to eat, you've got to drink, you've got to walk about. Abu Ayyub, Allah, he's, what he's doing is he's, he's you know, constricting himself to just stay to the, to cling to the walls, side walls of, of his house. And his wife is looking at him. When he wants to go from here to there, he's shimming across the sides of the walls. He's not even walking. He just, just go there. What, what's, what's wrong? He's wondering. And he says, I don't want this. My heart keeps thinking. What if I'm going to stand on a place on top and the Prophet Islam's blessed head might be underneath. I don't want my foot to be above in line with the blessed head of the Prophet Islam. So just out of the I'm going to walk around the walls. And then uh, on one cold night, there was a, a, j- a jug of water. And back then, they didn't have you know, types, taps and piping. They had you know, uh, containers that would hold water. Mm-hmm. Now the container falls and the water starts to seep. We know even in our house, if you drop loads of water on the ceiling, eventually it's, it'll go through the floorboards, it'll go through the plaster and it'll start dripping down. Back then the construction wasn't as robust as ours. 
So he's so worried that this water is going to drop and cause the cleave of the Prophet. He takes the only blanket that he had during winter time. The only blanket that he had in a cold night, he throws it on the ground and just wipes up all the water. I don't want any decree to happen to the Prophet. And this is the level of ihtiram. And really that's also why Allah chose him to be the descendant of all the other descendants to have that house. But this is the level of love. And this is just one example. Abu Ayyub is one of all the people of Yathrib. And we're going to see what they do further and further ahead until they're given that title of Ansar. You have those who have one level of uh, honor and dignity. They're going to be the Muhajireen. They're going to be those people who are with the Prophet Sallallahu from Makkah from, you know, from the beginning. And they're going to keep staying with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi all the way until they migrate with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and come to Yathrib, to Medina al Munawwara. They left Makkah and did Hijrah for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Those people who did that, that Hijrah till the Fatih Makkah, Muhajireen. Mm. From wherever they came, especially from Makkah, those are the Muhajireen. But the people of Medina who came as absolute strong supporters and helpers of the Prophet were at the time when he needed support. And remember what we said, Sheikh Zakaria mentioned in Shammai that the seal of the Prophet he had two uh, riwayat. One is Allah Rasul Muhammad and the other one was Sirf Ant al-Mansur. Go wherever you are. The Prophet's mission was in Makkah. When he came to say, you know what? Where else am I going to be supported? He left Makkah and he went to a place where he found Ansar, that are going to make him feel Mansur. I'm assisted by, divinely assisted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were given the name by the Prophet saying, these are the Muhajirin of Kabul Makkah, you're my Ansar, you're my supporters and my helpers, because they came at such a time and they supported the Prophet So this is Sayyidina Abu Ayyub looking after the, after the Prophet The rest of the Ansar, they went and took all of the other Sahaba, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, all of the Sahaba, whoever came, they come into our homes. Take our homes, stay with us. And they looked after the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Sahaba so well that the Sahaba of Makkah who have been there, the Sahaba Kudul Awalun, who were mentioned in the Quran as the foremost uh, pioneers of Islam, they came to the Prophet and think, exactly. saying, these people are so hospitable and they're supporting Islam and us so well that we're worried they're going to take all of the hasanat, they're going to take all the reward. We don't know how we can compete with them. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, the likes of these Sahaba are wondering that these people are so amazing. They're opening their hearts to us in such a manner. They've got so much muhabba for us. We think they're going to take all the reward and we're going to be overshadowed. No, even though we've been there from the beginning. And the Prophet just instructs and just makes dua for them. This is, you can see how they took the heart of the Prophet when they eased and gave him relief after all of the years, those years of persecution. And that's what makes them some of the greatest people in this world. And that's why they got the honor of the Prophet telling them, I am yours and you are mine. Mm. They, they got the honor. So the Prophet then continues, you know, as the few days go, is they settle in, in, in Medina and now the Prophet we're going to see how he establishes the city of Medina Munawwara. But at this moment, it's also important to mention that when the Prophet was entering this spectacle that we just mentioned, when the Prophet is coming into Medina Munawwara, he's going through Taniyat al-Wada, through the valley between the two mountains, and he's going through all of these homes. As well as the people of Medina, there were other uh, onlookers, if you will. As we said yesterday, that when the, the Muslims rushed out, the Jews of Medina also came out to say, happening here what's this commotion mm-hmm. and they say oh that prophet that they kept going around about he's here and this also is going to lead to a spur of events but when these people come out there's also a certain group of the Jews that come led by a person known as Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul he was someone who before the prophet of entry like we said this is a very fractioned uh, and segregated place but he you know from among the different fractions someone who had um, from the different parties of Yathrib Someone who had an overwhelming vote, if you will, and considered himself to be acting president or ruler of, of Yathrib was Abdullah ibn Ubay. He just thought, you know, I'm, I'm nearly going to get there. Eventually, I'm just going to establish my place as the ruler set of, of Yathrib. That's it. Now, he's seeing this person enter, and for the first time in his life, hundreds of countless of people of Yathrib have come together, and one voice, they're just accepting him as literally pledging their life to him. Mm. Saying, you are our everything. <clears throat> you are our... Our master, our leader, our guide. And this threatens him on another level, thinking, wait a minute. Besides the Jews, everyone else in Yathrib is becoming Muslim and following him. And the more the days go by, that scene is just striking him, thinking, I'm threatened by this now. So this is going to now lead a stir of events in the background. But we just need to mention this t- that takes place at this moment. There's also someone else, but who at this moment isn't classified as uh, part of the Jewish uh, people of Medina. He's not classified as, as part of the people of Yathrib. He's not even classified as a Yathribi. He's not even classified as an Arab. He's a slave that they know as Al-Farisi. You know, the Persian slave. Who's just been, you know, who's been wronged. And his backstory is something we have to really look into. But he's also someone that stands up. And when he hears 
about this moment. He's not even there to witness when he hears about the Prophet going to Quba and entering from Taniyat al-Wada. His heart is just trembling. And we're going to see what happens with him as well a bit later on. But now going back to the Prophet wasallam, as he's in the city of, of Medina Munawwara, he now begins to establish what is going to be Medina Munawwara, the foundations of Medina Munawwara. The Prophet wasallam, first he establishes brotherhood between the Muhajirun and the Ansar. The, the ulama mentions that this already took place in Makkah where the Prophet established brotherhood between the, the Makkans, the Buhajirin. Now he's going to do it on two different levels. Saying, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're Yathribi or Madinan or Makkan, whether you're from Khazraj or Aus, or whether you're from Quraysh or Aidi or Bani Makzum, wherever you're from, whatever tribe, you're, whatever last name you've got, whatever color you've got, whether you're uh, a Habish, whether you're, uh, you're Abyssinian, whether you're Arab, whoever you are, whatever you are, you're all brothers now. And the Prophet enacted that verse, Inna Mu'minun Ikhwa. I've established brother bonds of brother between all of you. And there were some that were even tied together saying, you are the brother of you, as though they're blood brothers. Yeah. And the Sahaba took this so seriously that the Ansar, when they were bonded with brotherhood, they would literally take their brother and say, listen, half of my house is yours. Half my business is yours. Half my wealth is yours. In an instant. You're my children, take my children. You're my wives, I'll divorce some of them, you go marry some of them. Like, whatever's mine is yours. As though they were blood brothers. And the Prophet just broke all of that discord and brought absolute unity to all of them. They were scared even if anyone had like a little bit of still, you know what, um, I'm a Khazraji, I'm a also, I'm from this time, I'm this high, I'm higher than you. The Prophet would, would you know, uh, uh, staunchly tell them off straight to admonish them, saying, leave this, it's got the stench of Jahiliyyah. You smell like, in other words, of those people, like Abu Jahl and the likes, don't ever say this again. And he established, and these people didn't even need that reminder, there was maybe one or two but the overwhelming majority of them, they just, it was just filled with muhabba and love, unlike ever before. There was this absolute unity that the Prophet kept establishing further and further. And after he established this unity, he also acknowledged the fact that there are other people that are Muslim. They're not following the same faith as us. And as the ruler and the, the governing ruler and the king prophet of Medina and Munawwara and of all of these believers, I know if I'm going to rule this entire city, I have to rule it with justice. The, the Prophet even calls the Jews of Medina. The Jews of Yathrib and the, the, the fortresses of Khaybar, those Jews that saw them at him as a threat, he invites them and come. And he speaks to them and he, uh, he establishes a treaty as part of establishing the constitution of Medina. And look at this, that treaty is so inspiring. The Prophet mentions every Jew is free to practice his religion with complete religious freedom and religious tolerance. We're not going to force you to accept Islam. And your, your life, your safety is a responsibility of the Muslims. Your safety is, respons- is our responsibility. Every Muslim has to be responsible for your safety. And he, he, he takes out any establishment of class, saying whoever you class as the lowest ranking of the Muslims, and whoever you class as the highest ranking, are all equal. They're all going to get the same equal, same equal opportunities. You're not better because you're rich or you're in a particular wealth class or a particular tribe. All of the oppression of Makkah and uh, other places that were had in the world, it's all gone. The only thing that differentiates you is taqwa. And the only person that can, one that can see taqwa is Allah. So no one can judge between each other and say, I'm better than the other. You're all the same. And he established in the allies, if, if you're attacked, if, even if you're a Jew, if you're attacked or we're attacked, we're going to help each other and we're going to protect Medina together. And the, the, even the Jewish people that were threatened by him couldn't argue with this thinking. We've never seen such a fair uh, uh, in a treaty and such a fair constitution that she gives absolute religious tolerance and gives us such good cohesion between each other, saying we can co- coexist together. You can remain as, uh, and practice your religion and live your lives. We can live our lives in, in uh, you know, coexistence. We can work together with cohesion. But you can be you, we can be us. You have your religion, your lifestyle. We have our religion, our lifestyle. And we respect that. And we're going to learn to di- agree to disagree. We're going to work together on that in fairness and justice. And these, fairness and justice, these were the words that were mentioned in that constitution and treaty of the Prophet so to, so. The, to the other uh, groups and the other faiths and the, the other backgrounds in the Yathrib. Yath- so the Prophet establishes brotherhood between the Muslims and he establishes peaceful coexistence in the city of the Prophet the most peaceful city on earth. And he transforms Medina into what we know, as we said yesterday, in 2022, the World Health Organization is going to tell us the best living quality is going to be in Medina, the best air quality, the best lifestyle, the healthiest lifestyle you can get. One of them is going to be in Medina in, from all the cities in the world. They listen to Medina at the top, amongst the top cities. And that's, even the science is saying the place of the Prophet resides is the purest place to be. That like this, the Prophet establishes Medina as his city in the coming months. And the next thing the Prophet also does is establish a masjid. Just like they establish a masjid in the Quba, the Prophet speaks to the Sahaba and they establish a masjid 
which we're going to know as Masjid al-Nabawi, the beautiful Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we all yearn to visit. That Masjid al-Nabawi with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, first thing they need is a piece of land. Where does the Prophet go? Remember we said, da'uha fa innaha ma'muratun. Leave my camel because she is divinely guided. Remember she stopped at, a, at one place and then got up and moved ahead to the house. That place she stopped, the Prophet understood this was the place that Allah has instructed me to build Masjid al-Nabawi. So the Prophet goes to those two orphans, Sahal and Suhail, and he speaks to the uncle and says, we want to purchase this land to build Masjid al-Nabawi. Now look at those orphans, they children, but they say, Ya Rasulullah, that land is donated from us, free of charge. We don't want any penny for the land. But look at the Prophet he says, no, we're going to pay for this land. And he speaks to Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Abu Bakr has that honor to say, you know what, I'm going to be the one to purchase this land. And look how blessed he is. The entire land was purchased. He gave 10 dinars. He said, look, I'm going to purchase this land upon which the Masjid never be. Every foundation, everything that will be built upon it will be on this land that I bought first. So he purchases this land from the two orphans, Sahal and Suhail, radiallahu anh, and they then build, they, they dig up this land and they, they give the foundations about three cubits uh, deep. They build the foundations of Masjid never be. And some of the, the scholars of Sira and the, some of the scholars of Tariq mentioned that when they were unearthing this land, they found the grave of Tumba. And he found him buried with those tablets that he wrote for the Prophet Allah, yes, Allah even preserved that much saying, I'm not even going to let those words decay. And he, he, he chose it, that the land for Tubba to be buried and the Masjid al-Nabawi. The same soil close to where the Prophet is going to be buried. That's, that's what love can get a believer. When you love Allah and the Prophet Allah. So on this land, they then dig the foundations, three cubits or so deep, and they built the Masjid al-Nabawi, which based on differing opinions is either 100 cubits long and 100 cubits wide, or 60, and there's different uh, required, but on average, if you look at 100 cubits by 100 cubits square, that was built and it was built by you know, the most simple construction. You have you know, a simple date palm trees that were used as, as pillars. The leaves were used you know, with other forms of uh, string to make a roof, you know, just a, a plain roof, just to give some kind of shade from the sun. It wasn't even a fixed kind of roof with stone yeah. and brick, anything like that, or wood timber, nothing like that. Just a basic roof, basic pillars. And then they would make uh, the, the bricks and the Sahaba, the, under the leadership of the Prophet, look at how they're going to build the Masjid al-Nabawi. They're not going to build it. Unfortunately, a lot, a lot of our masajid, a lot of our children, unfortunately, when they see our imams or they see our mosque leaders or our mosque, uh, the people that establish our mosque, they associate it with people that they're scared of. Mm-hmm. The people with long beards and big frowns. But the Rasul of Allah, one of the so most sorry. beautiful smile. And as in Abdullah ibn Harith says, I never saw anyone more joyous and smiling than the Prophet. So when he's establishing Masjid al-Nabawi, you see just absolute mahabba and absolute love and uh, you know, just lightheartedness in the way that the youth were involved in building this masjid. You have the wisdom of the elders and the wisdom of the Prophet You have the elder sahaba and you have the young sahaba and you see how they all get along and how the Prophet is motivating them to build this masjid. The, fir- the first thing is the Prophet also distributes the sahaba amongst their skill. You have said that Talq ibn Ali who narrates that when the bricks were being made and they were being carried at that moment I said to the Prophet let me also get involved in this. Said, no, 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 you make the mortar because that's what you're skilled at. He took each person and utilized their skill in the best capacity to build Masjid al-Nabawi. Mm. So then the Talqib Ali, he goes and he starts mixing, mixing the mortar. He's making the mortar. The rest of the Sahaba with the Prophet Islam, he didn't just stand and say, you do this, you do that and lead. He leads by example, by practice. He takes the bricks himself and on his chest. And these are bricks are on his heart and he takes them physically and, it's, and he takes upon responsibility to establish the bricks. Until he comes and he places the first brick of Masjid al-Nabawi by his blessed hands, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to the Riwayah of Tabarani. After him, Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Dilal comes, holding the brick in his own, places the next brick. Then Sayyidina Umar al-Dilal, upon the instruction of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr comes, then Sayyidina Umar comes and al-Dilal, he places the next brick. Then Sayyidina Uthman al and then Sayyidina Ali al These five became the first people who established the bricks of Masjid al-Nabawi and then the rest of the Sahaba. And the Prophet continues bringing the bricks with them. Whilst the elders are there, the senior Sahaba, like Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he's there overlooking everything and helping and working hard. And Sayyidina uh, uh, Rasulullah, he's oh. there, he's also working hard and he's instructing them how to do things. And then you've got the likes of Sayyidina Ali, young Sahabi. And he looked at Sayyidina Uthman and Maz'un, another young Sahabi. Now Sayyidina Uthman, he's got a nice, you know, clean cloth. He's wearing clean clothes. And he's like thinking these bricks are really dusty. So he wants to help and he's helping. He's getting his hands dirty, if you will. But he's just like, he's holding the bit carefully. Whereas everyone else is just on the chest, on the stomach, going. He's holding him carefully to make sure that his clothes aren't uh, in a dirty. I said, Ali, he starts singing a poem about him. I didn't say, have you seen the one who was like, so careful about his clothes, he doesn't want to get any speck of dust on him. And he makes a humorous poem until the Sahaba start laughing. And they start laughing at Sayyidina Uthman. And by doing so, Ali also 
jokingly teaches him a point saying it's more rewarding getting down and dusty for Allah. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about your clothes. But the Prophet sees this and they, in, you know, they allow this humor to take place between youth. And then the Sahaba with the Prophet they start chanting in a Shi together. They say, La khayr illa khayr al akhirah. Allah mansuri ansar al muhajira. Allah, there's no goodness except the goodness of the akhirah. Allah bless and give assistance to the Ansar and the Muhajir. And the Prophet and the Sahaba are singing this and is many in the couplets. So the most you know, beautiful masjid and the masjid of the Prophet is being established. And you have youth joking with each other. You have a nasheed and the, the jokes are not there to just mock each other. The jokes are there in a pure form to you know, bring each other even closer to Allah. Mm. And in, with so much muhabbah, they're not getting offended. And they're singing nasheeds together. And the Prophet is also reciting these words. And Abu Bakr is reciting these words. That's the level of love and muhabba with which they built this first masjid in Nabawi that would become, and when it's established, it was, you, know, you might not feel like, oh, there's a glistening dome there, or there's a glistening chandelier, all of that. It was just a, a square. But it was so beautiful and it was so you know, illuminated that when they walked in, they just felt something different. Like, we were part of Islam before. When we walk in now, if he sees something different, and to see the Prophet standing in front and then delivering khutbah to them, to lead them in salah. And that, that was that masjid was now the establishment and the foundations that now the Prophet has cemented himself and his new community in the city of Medina and Munawwara. Like this, the Prophet establishes this new city of Medina and Munawwara and how now the first year of the Prophet is going to go you know, from uh, establishing the city and his journey in Medina and Munawwara. We'll discuss it in the next um, episode of the Seerah as we stop in this beautiful uh, uh, construction of Masjid Nabawi of the Prophet. And at this point, we also like to mention that. A project that is quite close to our heart that you know, reminds us at this time when we discuss this beautiful construction of Masjid Nabawi. Our madrasa where we study, you know, the Beit Muhammad Academy, under the tutelage of our teachers. We've studied there, we've seen all the students that have studied there for the last 10, 11 years you know, in a small house. Mm. And that house feels like that will welcome to us. The way the Prophet and the Sahaba yes, taught, were taught in that small house. And Allah blesses us with that land. And you know, there were people like Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, that donated towards that land so we could build our Beit Muhammad from there. And now Allah has gone, got us to that stage where we need bricks. Mm. We need bricks. And we, we urge everyone, you know, sincerely from the bottom of our hearts, that that, that madrasa that allowed us to study, where we sat and, uh, at the feet of our teachers and studied, we're in need of people to donate bricks you know, towards this blessed uh, building. I and mean, who will be that uh, person that will be in the ranks of the Prophet Sallallahu yes. Alaihi Wasallam in the Day of Judgment because of this task they say I they make an intention, Ya Rasulullah, you were the first one who took the responsibility of lugging those bricks on your heart, your chest, and establishing them. I'm going to take responsibility to establish the first thousand bricks of this building. Who's going to be the one that says, you know what, I want to be with the Sayyidina Abu Bakr I'm going to be the one who's going to take 750 bricks, or 500 and be with Sayyidina Umar or 250 and be with Sayyidina Uthman or just 100 bricks, just a thousand pounds. You can just go and take a, 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 a hundred days, take one brick a day, just 10 pounds, 10 pounds a brick. Go, I want you to do that one brick. And between our friends and family, 100 days, one brick each. And like this, we, know, we can make that attention to be amongst the ranks of these people and you know, donate a brick. Or you know, just go to www.bmacademy.org.uk bmacademy.org.uk Our mother Sabait Muhammad Academy. Go there and just donate, even if it's one brick. Fund this, whatever you want. Fund this mm-hmm. and donate for your family. You know, these bricks, they're not going to be... Uh, I've seen other organizations where um, uh, they fundraise uh, you know, for a marked brick campaign, an engra- engraved brick, where you can... Donate a brick and whatever message, whatever name you put on, that brick will be put on the building with that name. We're not asking you to be you know, engraved in, in chalk. We're not saying these bricks are going to be engraved uh, you know, with uh, laser uh, CNC machines. We're saying these bricks are going to be engraved by light. That name is going to say there, even when the world isn't here, even in the Akira, that name will be engraved on that brick, on that structure. So for as long as eternity will be there, your loved ones, your, the ones who have passed away, they're going to get that reward. So we urge everyone as a sincere request to donate in front of the injuries towards these bricks. And we pray that by this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us and everyone who gets involved, the rank, to be amongst the ranks of these blessed Sahaba who Amen. erected the, the beautiful construction of Masjid Nabawi. Just to add to what you said, Mullah Sufyan, as they say, distances are rolled up through love. And just like Tuba, um, Rahimahullah, his distance with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in time and space and everything was rolled up because of his love. But the means of his love reaching the Prophet ﷺ was through the ulama. He passed it on to an alim, who passed it on That's to his it. silsila of ulama, ulama until he came to Abu, uh, Ayyub al-Ansari uh, radiallahu ta'ala. And so likewise for us going in the opposite direction back to the Prophet ﷺ, why not connect to an alim, to the ulama, 
who have connections to ulama and what are better connections than the ones that Bait Muhammad, mm-hmm. alhamdulillah, we have who are our teachers, teachers, people who are blood connected to the Prophet mm-hmm. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that their mother's line goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their father's line goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What better connection can we have to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a better a means of our love reaching the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give us all the tawfiq Ameen. to take Ameen. lessons from the, the beautiful seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to embody his life, his characteristic Ameen. into our Ameen. lives, his way of living into our way of living and allow us to connect to him through our love just like Tubba connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa akhiru da'wan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.